this is a whole new world. And with a platform like yours that quantifies things, that, that is, is able to show people what is happening in the air world, because this, you know, things change. I mean, departments of wildlife are adding this all the time, but I don't know. I live in Oklahoma. If I wasn't in this, I wouldn't have known that Kansas is about, or at least considering doing this. I wouldn't know that Arkansas, it's legal to do that unless I went out and checked the regulations. And why would I do that? Because I don't know anything about air, but something like this, you, you, you see what you can do. And if a guy can kill a K buffalo with an air gun, I think I could probably kill a black bear. And we're live. Airgun Hunting Legion video cast number four, I believe, with Mr. Steve Scott, who has killed some incredibly dangerous, incredibly large game with an air rifle. Steve, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming back a second day after uh, <laughs> some, some technical glitches. Technical glitches and forcing me to get on the uh, use the Zoom life versus the Google life. So, well, it looks like you made the right decision, at least so far. Yeah, such better quality, crystal clear. But um, so I know you're, you're not supposed to be even in this country right now. That no. no, I should be in Zimbabwe right now chasing a Cape Buffalo. But thanks to our friends in Asia giving us this, uh, this little gift, uh, I've missed three trips to Africa plus a couple of other ones. Yeah. And uh, it's just really hard. I've been to Africa 52 times. So this will be the first year since 1994 that I have not at least done one hunt in Africa. So 1994, what's been the difference between hunt Africa in 94 and now, other than obviously the virus? But I know it's changed a lot. And you've probably it was seen a lot it. cheaper. It, was a lot it, cheaper. it wasn't quite as popular. It, it was a lot cheaper. And um, I'd like to think that we had a little bit to do with that because the purpose of Safari Hunters Journal was to make people aware that Africa is an affordable destination. And when I first presented the idea, we had a show on the Outdoor Channel and I presented to them in probably 2000 to do an, an Africa show as well. And they said, people aren't interested in that, it's too expensive. And I asked the program director, uh, how much did you spend on your last elk hunt? And of course he responded, well, I don't hunt, which I thought was a telling for the outdoor channel. But I, I said, well, how much do you think you would have spent? He said, I don't know, you know, five or $6,000. And I said, that's probably right. And now remember this is in 2000 and it's actually applicable today as well for another reason. But you can go to Africa, including airfare, take five animals, spend a week there for less than you would have spent on that elk hunt. And that was the genesis for getting Safari Hunters Journal on the Outdoor Channel. And that was the message that we conveyed because I joined Safari Club International to learn how to someday, way in the future, go to Africa and do one hunt. I bought a 375, which I had no need for, but that was what I did to give me the goal to go to Africa. I went within a year because I bought some stupid thing at a luncheon, and it turned out, you know, there was a steen buck and a warthog in the package, you know, about $400 worth of animals, and I go over there and spend about eight grand, which is exactly what the outfitter was looking for. And it, it, you know, I thought, well, I better shoot as much as I can because I may never get back. And then of course I went back the next year and, and more and more and more. And that is the, the thing that is, was really different to answer your question between then and now, there wasn't as much traffic. There weren't as many people going. And over the years, depending on the level of the RAND to the dollar, 
you know, hunts might get a little bit cheaper, they might get a little bit more expensive, but more and more people realized that Africa was a destination that was affordable. Yeah, and not so much for the dangerous game, but for this plethora of planes game that's there. And, you know, things have gone up and up and up. And, and you know, when, when, I, when I started, I mean, the trophy fee for all in was $8,000. And, you know, now South Africa has a different deal, but to hunt a lion in Tanzania, you know, we're talking about 60 plus. Today, how we've kind of come full circle, hunting became so popular and there was this demand for animals. So especially in South Africa, to a lesser extent in Namibia, but South Africa, they bred a lot of animals and they just kept breeding and breeding and breeding. And the supply of animals and professional hunters got to a point that the, the supply was so great that markets crash. And I'll give you an example. I'm brokering some of the hunts that I've, I've gone on before. And five years ago, to hunt a sable and a roan would be about $35,000. Right now, I have a sable roan package for eight grand. It's just markets have crashed, with the exception you know, of dangerous game and some special animals like kudu which everybody seen you know i've got a package right now of five decent animals in namibia for thirty five hundred dollars i've got another package in south africa with four animals that's nineteen hundred dollars i mean it's just unheard of now part of this is COVID because they're just trying to get anybody there and that has changed the game and it, it's likely gonna clear out a lot of operators because these people are having to go without income for a year and not that many businesses can survive that. So let me, let, as we're on the Africa topic, and I think a lot of people need to hear um, and, and try to really understand what hunting does for the local wildlife population. And especially we saw a couple of weeks ago where the state of California is moving forward with um, legislation that I think makes it criminal to eat, to import, um, you know, just, just the, the taxidermy Yeah, the taxidermy. So yeah. explain, and I've been to the, to the SCI show several times. I've covered it as a writer and just under, and, and I have a deep understanding. I think a lot of people do have an understanding of what this model of concert of wildlife conservation does for populations, but explain to the people that don't really understand uh, what hunting does for animals and for local economies. Um, they might see this. Well, there's, a, there's a couple of elements to this because the pushback that you're going to get from the, from the left is that hunting is a very small percentage of the overall economy, which is true. And that in certain places that ecotourism, the camera people, you know, photographers that are going to the Ngorongor crater and they're taking pictures of the wildebeest migration and the, you know, they've got lions and, and leopard or cheetahs in front of them. Those things, are so expensive and lots of people go and it generates a huge amount of money and it's not consumptive at all unless you consider that the lodges and that kind of thing. But with the exception of some places in Tanzania and Kruger Park and the, uh, uh, the Okavanga Delta and, and others, the rest of Africa, nobody goes to except for us. Because we go to places, hunters go to places in Africa that nobody else will go to. And what we bring when we go to those places are income because that camp is going to be fully staffed with lots of people. And I'll give you an example. I went on an elephant hunt in Botswana. And part of the uh, deal that the outfitter had with a local community that he would provide 35 jobs. One camp, 35 jobs. One guy's job was to light the lanterns every night. 
and then he picked the lights up in the morning. That was his job that he got, you know, some kind of income from. But not only do we pro provide jobs, we also provide food. And, and what's really ironic about Africa, the indigenous people live next door to wildlife. They're the ones that have to compete with crocodiles at the river when they're gathering water or doing washing, or hippos at the river if they're coming back from a night's feed. And, and of course, the, the elephants are just, they rain havoc all over the, the uh, cornfields, maize fields, when they're about to harvest. So these people are actually competing with wildlife, and yet all this meat that surrounds them, they don't have any protein in their diet. The, the vast majority, probably 90% of an indigenous African's diet is something that we would call maize. They have different terms for it. Here it's grits, there it's sudza, or uh, a bunch of different names, but it's just the white pasty cornmeal that you ball up and, and, and eat, and, and that's all they have. But when we come and harvest a problem elephant that is getting into the maize fields or a buffalo in the area, these people get meat and they get it for days, and, and they don't have that kind of nutrition usually unless the hunters are there. And we do this all over Africa, not in the five-star lodges in tricked out land cruisers that drive you up to a lion kill and you're surrounding, is surrounding it are 87 other land cruisers. That's great, it's pretty, and it gets people closer to nature, but that's not real in the respect that we're there, we're part of the ecosystem, we, we are in the animal's backyard. There it's a show, and there's nothing wrong with that. And when I've done it, it's been enjoyable, but it's expensive, and when the anti say that that generates so much more income than hunting, technically they're right, but it benefits about 0.007% of the African population. We do a lot more for people on the ground. So is there a reason why why the indigenous people can't hunt or is that is that something with their governments or they just choose not to, don't have the implements? I, that, that's been a question I've had for a long time actually and never really well, researched. You, get, you get into different things like, okay, baboons. You know, baboons can, can cause some, some damage. They can deal with those things. But the things that really cause the problems are crocodiles, because they are really, really smart and difficult to remove from an area. Unless someone gets very lucky, it's going to take someone with a high-powered rifle, and those things aren't available to most people there. Hippos actually kill more people in Africa than any other animal. It's not that the hippo actually wants to kill somebody. Right. It's just usually the person is between them and safety of the river, and they get run over. It does happen in boats. We've been attacked by hippos in, in boats before because they can be aggressive. But the real problem are, is the elephants. And what you hear is that the elephants are in danger. And truly, in some places they are. In Kenya, where they've stopped hunting, elephants are endangered. But in places like Botswana and the Caprivi Strip of Namibia and several places, including Kruger Park, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in Mozambique to a lesser extent, in Zambia, where they have hunting, elephant populations are growing, they're thriving, and we are brought in on a fairly regular basis to take out animals that are causing problems. And I'll just give you a quick example. The Ghana Rizzo Park, which is in southeastern Zimbabwe, when they made the park, they removed all the indigenous people from the park. And now they're on the outskirts, the elephants, they breed and they grow, and the population gets to a point where the park boundaries can't contain the population. So a 20, 25 year old, 15 year old, 30 year old elephant will go out of the park where it's dangerous 
in order to feed, to get better food, to get more weight, to compete with the herd bulls for mating rights. Mm -hmm. So what these teenagers are doing, they're, they're lifting, they're going to work out, so to speak. And they do it in the maize field of this farmer. He's got an acre, maybe two, and it's, 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 it's almost comical if it wasn't so real what they have to do. They have bull whips and, and they have cans that they clank together. And, and somebody might have an old black powder rifle or shotgun that they fill with nails and rocks that they shoot an elephant and it doesn't do anything but just make it hate humans and become a man killer because it's not going to kill the elephant. And so in order to mitigate some of these damages that the people that were moved to make room for the elephants, now the elephants are destroying their entire food supply. They bring a hunter in that pays the government a significant amount, five, eight, ten thousand dollars for the permit to harvest the elephant, and the, the hunter takes home nothing. Not a tusk, not skin, not the tail. The village people, the, the indigenous people, the chief gets his cut, and then people are in line. And I've got time-lapse footage from eight o'clock in the morning when we quit taking pictures to noon when there's nothing left but a wet spot in the sand where that elephant was. Wow. These people, 500 people in line waiting to get their share of the marauder that had been in their, in their, in their maze. I had one permit, there were five elephants. There's four others that are still gonna do it, but they're gonna think, of, think a little bit more about it because Fred didn't make it out. And so, you know, something's going on. So it may give them a little pause to go at least to that place again for a while. So at a bowl like the, the you shop, uh, mm -hmm. how much meat do you think pounds wise did, did the village pull off of that? I mean, it's hard to estimate it, it's on the ground, but. Yeah, it is. It, it depends on the size of the bull. And these are not the 14 foot tall bulls. The, you know, these are, you know, 11, 12 foot bulls. And they're going to, a bull like that is probably going to yield conservatively 2,000, 2,500 pounds of meat. I'll t tell you what's interesting. There, there's no refrigeration there. Right. And so they dry all the meat. And it looks like when you go into a village after we harvested this elephant, it looks like there has been a storm of meat that fell from the sky because every bush, every branch, everything that could conceivably hold a piece of meat has a piece of meat hanging from it so they dry it and they can preserve it in some for some time into the future right yeah elephant jerky basically i mean that's very that's what it is i, I had a, this guy i went to college with he had grown up uh, as a you know in a, in a missionary family out there and he had pictures in his in his dorm of like him and his uncles and, and the people in the village with like 11 baskets of hippo meat. And it was just commonplace. And they actually, we actually did a traditional goat roast um, yeah. and for, for the guys in our dorm. Um, and he led like this traditional African ceremony. It was absolutely amazing. Um, but um, so, so what 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 was it about Africa though that that drew you there? Like, did you always, was that something that came from when you were a kid that you wanted to to go to Africa and hunt, or was that um, there that there was some of that? You know, it, it was more the you know outdoor life and field and stream at Grandpa's house, reading about mule deer and elk. That's kind of what fanned the fire. Right. But Africa is always in the back of my mind because that's the mecca. I mean, that's the Everest of hunting. Now, some people argue that there's some sheep that are maybe more expensive and maybe more difficult to get, certainly. But as far as a place for hunters to go, there's no better place in Africa because you've got 60, 70 species on the continent that are, that are huntable, many of which can kill you. 
Mm. And that leads an entire new level of excitement to the game. I mean, you know, a white-tailed deer is great. Occasionally, if you have really bad luck, you might have a problem with a buck in rut. But that ain't the way it is with a Cape buffalo that you're following through the Jess. So are you so, – uh, would you consider yourself an adrenaline junkie in that regard? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I'll tell you, just as an aside, yeah. uh, one of the things that – that I missed out on this year. I was going to take a friend of mine who's a well-known writer, and I won't mention his name until we do the article, right. but I was taking him to South Africa. We were going to, I was gonna film him harvesting his first Cape Buffalo, because that's what he's always wanted to do. And the reason I was doing that for him, he was going to, we were then going to fly to Spain and drive to Pamplona because he runs with the bulls and that's something I've always wanted to do. So we were going to spend three days running, shoot his Cape Buffalo, go to Spain, run with the bulls and then come home. Right. And I missed all that. So yeah, you might say that about adrenaline. I, I, I self-diagnosis, I probably have to plead guilty. Yeah. I guess, there, I guess there's worse things. So, <laughs> so you've got an awesome Instagram handle. and we'll, we'll put it up here um, with all sorts of fantastic, photos and good social content um but you've got some awesome videos um of killing very large animals with big bore air rifles um how did the air gun hunting start for you well it started out of necessity um uh, because i don't get to do what i do and i don't get to bring it to people unless i have sponsors so I was sponsored by an air gun company and they had an innovative product that hadn't been on the market before. It had performance capabilities that hadn't been on the market before. And I don't know, 2003, 2004, uh, I took a 150, 175 pound feral hog with a 17 caliber, 177 caliber air gun. And I pull the trigger and I can't believe it. Now, there's some, there's some caveats to this. We're running them with dogs and I'm shooting from 11 yards. But it was very much like shooting an elephant with a brain shot because hit it between the, with a hog up from up and from, from above instead of from below with an elephant. Right. You shoot it between the eyes, a little bit above between the eyes, and it just falls over dead. And, and I couldn't believe it. And we we did a, a bunch of pigs like that. It created quite a stir and we sold a lot of air guns and then the company decided to go another direction and, and got it more into squirrel hunting, which is, is fine. Um, I was kind of a free agent at that point and a friend of mine in the industry said, why don't you talk to Umarex? We discussed, they told me what they had and frankly, it fit me a lot better because what I'm trying to do with uh, 1500 foot per second 177 caliber pellet it doesn't really transfer to truly big game mm -hmm. but what Umarex had in the works and I had a prototype and the production took a while to get it right but what I had and have now and what is in production and being delivered is a 50 caliber PCP air gun that shoots anywhere between a 200 and 550 grain projectile. What I'm dialed in with is a 350 grain hard cast bullet that does about 946 feet per second, which is slow, but I can tell you from personal experience, it is enough to kill just about anything on the planet and given the right circumstances, anything on the planet. Um, and so I went to Africa and did a field test. And the first thing I harvested was a Gems buck and then a blessed buck, which are, you know, good size, white-tailed deer, mule deer, small elk size animals. And then I harvested a wildebeest and blue wildebeest are, 450 pounds. They're a good size animal. But more importantly, they are one of the most tenacious animals out there. It is really, really hard to bring down a, a, a blue wildebeest unless you make a, a, a good shot. And I made a good shot, 
but the thing runs a hundred yards. So we did some more planes game and decided that we should try big game, dangerous game. And, uh, you know, I, I, I experienced some problems in the field because, you know, with international travel and the gun being uh, different pressures and different temperatures in the hold of the plane, caused some problems with O-rings and, you know, we got all that worked out. And I got on a, a Cape Buffalo and I had it. I mean, I had it dead to rights. I was above it on a, on a little bit of a, a, a hill and it had stopped below me. The herd was running by and I bleeded and it stopped and my gun goes click. Mm. And the reason the gun went click is it required a charge, you know, pulling the, the bolt such that it is back and then clicking it in and I just pushed it forward and it did nothing. So there's a point of me telling you this. Uh, we don't get the Cape Buffalo and I'm disappointed, but the place where I was, was Hart's View, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Hunter's Hill Safaris in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. They have a lot of game there, a lot. And they had Asian water buffalo. It was a wild herd, but there's Asian water buffalo. They even have American bison there. I mean, the guy has a lot of game. And so we made a quick play for uh, a water buffalo and made a good stalk, got to about 35 yards, and I shot it in the shoulder. And it starts to run off, and I shoot it in the right shoulder, and it's limping on its left leg. And it's like, it's not computing, but you're in the heat of the moment, reloading and everything. And the bull went down. It went down within 30 seconds. It was dead within two minutes. And I was ecstatic because this is an animal not as aggressive, but it's actually larger than the Cape Buffalo. And yeah, I've shared the pictures with you, and I don't know if, if you want to show them or not, but we did a post-mortem on this thing, and this bullet traveled completely through the chest cavity and hit what we would call the humerus bone, the big, heavy upper bone, and broke it in two. So this bullet went completely through a 2,000 pound water buffalo and still had the energy to break a major bone into two pieces, not cracked, not chipped, but separated. And that told me what I needed to know. This thing will do the job. And since then, we've taken a lot of big game, including a couple of Cape Buffalo. Yeah, and on on the chest of a water buffalo, and even a Cape Buffalo, I mean, that's gotta be what? How, how many inches wide is that? I mean, 36. Yeah, I'm gonna say at least 30, 40. 36 inches, yeah. You know, it's uh, like having that much power, um, that just, to me, it speaks volumes as a guy that has just always hunted whitetail and elk a couple of times, um, of the power of these, uh, of these air guns. Um, so when you're getting ready for something like a dangerous game animal, what's the process of preparation like going in um, with, with the, with the big bore air guns. Whether it's a big bore air gun, a handgun, or a 500 Jeffrey, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter. The most important thing is that you're comfortable with your weapon and you're able to place a, an accurate shot. And, and I mean a highly accurate shot mm -hmm. because with dangerous game, I, I've been fortunate. Um, I've, I've harvested 22 K Buffalo. And I have not had to have an extensive track on, on any of them. A well-placed bullet, a well-placed arrow, a, a well-placed air gun projectile will bring down any dangerous game animal. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still a little uh, squishy on a rhino and I'll never be doing that anyway, but, uh, the K buffalo has a different type of anatomy in that the rib cage, all of the ribs overlap. So there's not a gap. With an elephant, there's a pretty big gap. Big ribs, but there's a gap. 
with a bison, which was the, truly the first dangerous animal that we harvested. Bison's big and heavy, but you know, breaking through their rib cage is not a trick. Cave buffalo, you know, they have an armor-plated chest cavity, and you have to break the bone in, in, able to, in order to be able to get the projectile in, which makes bow hunting kind of difficult. You know, you have to be able to, to penetrate that and still be able to get into the, to the heart lungs to, to do damage. But with, with the, the hammer, the Umarex hammer, this thing just blows it up. I, I mean, you're finding your bullet in the shoulder on the other side. I mean, it, uh, as a zebra that I, I shot, which is a, you know, a very heavy, tough animal shot on the front shoulder and the, the bullet is in the hind quarter. I mean, completely transverse the, the body cavity. And I, I, you know, I haven't experimented with 200 grain bullets and heavier bullets because what I've got right now is a, is a winning combination. And I'll, I'll tell you this because we have probably a different audience than if we were doing television, but the, probably the, the biggest proof for me was in Namibia and I have friends there and they have an 80,000 acre combination photo and hunting operation. Mm -hmm. And they have a, at the time, uh, a pride of lions. I think there's 17. It's, it's gotten bigger. But they'd rescued uh, a pride of lions from a, a rancher that was going to kill him because he was killing his cattle. And they brought in a vet, you know, helicopter and darted all the lions and brought them in. And these lions are within a 5,000 acre enclosure, but they have to eat. Mm -hmm. So they kill a giraffe, one giraffe every week. And they have 1,200 giraffe on their place. So uh, still taking out 52 a year, the population is still growing. Yeah, they, they but do reproduce. People need to understand, they do reproduce. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. They do. And you know, they don't make noise and they have pretty eyelashes, but they're still you know, animals that are in the food chain. Right. And a giraffe will feed a pride of, uh, of lions for, for a week. Mm -hmm. So my friend asked if I wanted to go out because we're going to shoot a giraffe. He said, do you want to try the, the hammer? And I said, honestly, I don't know if it'll do it because a giraffe is very much like a dangerous game animal because it's 3,500 pounds and its skin is over two inches thick. That's I mean, giraffe skin is, is heavy. So you have to penetrate this thick, wet blanket and then break through heavy bones to get to a heart and lung, which is very far forward. So you can't, your shot has to be exactly right. And keep in mind, Jason, everything that I'm, I'm shooting now, everything dangerous that I'm shooting, I insist that I'm within 50 yards. Because one, a dangerous game hunt outside of 50 yards isn't really a dangerous game hunt. You're just shooting stuff. But there's an efficacy problem because I'm going 946 feet per second with a rock and it's not going to fly flat. It's going to start dropping off very quickly. And so what kind of terminal energy am I going to have at 100 yards? I don't know because I haven't had enough time to work with the gun. But we're out. We're going to try this giraffe and there's a, a 375 sitting right there that the pH has. And if the shot doesn't work, then he'll just finish it. So we drive up, and this is one of those times where we're collecting meat. We weren't hunting. And you can't stock up on a giraffe very easily because they'll take you coming in with a vehicle, but you get out and they're gone. So we're in the cruiser. We get to 70 yards, and that's the, as close as we're going to get, which is 20 yards, probably 30 yards further than I want to shoot something like this. And he stands and stands and stands and I'm trained on him because he's standing like this and he finally takes a step and when he takes a step and opens this up I have the right angle and I shoot and he like nothing happened he continues to walk and he walks about probably 30 meters and he stops and turns and back and looks at us and this went on this stare down went for 
30 seconds and he didn't move. And I'm thinking, ah, I'm going to have to get the big gun out. And then I noticed just the slightest leg tremor, just the slightest. I thought, hmm, something's up here. And he starts to walk and now he's parallel on us. He's not walking away. And, and you know, then he does that little, you know, stumble and then the next leg stumbles and you know now this is going well and he goes down and we're just man i can't believe it happened and then he gets up again but it is really it, you know giraffe's brain is way way up there and, and low blood pressure it's really hard for them to function and and all four legs are splayed out and it's you know trying to stay up and finally it just flings itself backwards and honestly i don't know if the, the the bullet from the hammer actually killed it or the impact with its head hitting the ground killed it but this 3500 pound giraffe went down with one shot from an air rifle at 70 yards and that's it i mean this isn't something we're going to put on television because you know what would happen but we fed a bunch of lions with this thing that was going to get was going to get killed, and we did a field test, and the hammer passed with flying colors. I, other than maybe two species, I think you could take any animal in the world, and I would not hesitate to hunt the biggest brown bear there is. I wouldn't hesitate to hunt anything that you can hunt at relatively close range. And to me, hunting with an air gun, this big bore air gun is kind of like hunting with a handgun. You have a little bit better range than you have with a bow and arrow. Some people can shoot a bow pretty far, a lot better than I can. But a handgun, you know, 125, 150 yards is really probably maximum range for most people. And with the right bullet combination, I think 100, 125, maybe 150 yard shot with a hammer would be doable. Are you, uh, do you make your own bullets or how do you, uh, you buy them from the manufacturer? I know some guys that I've been talking to the last couple of uh, weeks here as we get ready for the launch of the Sports Lab, some guys are dedicated to making their own. Their own I'm really bullets. sorry, I'm not here. In anything you're saying. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? I barely. Our, our audio is going down. Really? Yeah, at least from my end. Let me see if I can. Okay, you're on max now. So. How's that? That's good. Okay. So do you make your own bullets? No. <laughs> no, I am not. Um, I, you know, and that's great. That's, that's fantastic. And 50 years ago, that was a really important thing if you're going to be an accurate shooter. But today, you know, bullets are, factory bullets are pretty, pretty accurate. And there's a level with this air gun that most people don't take into account because the relative hardness of a bullet, the Brunel, is going to have a lot to do with that's going to have a lot to, to, to do with the determination of which bullet you use because if we're going to do heavy dangerous game the Brunel needs to be very high it needs to be a hard cast lead you know almost a solid and a lot of times with some of these animals the bullet comes out pristine if it's even in the animal with the dangerous game there might be some deflection but with smaller game, like with a white tail or a bear or a lion or leopard that's soft skin, I would want something that's very soft in order to provide some hydrostatic shock, but a larger wound channel. And uh, we use buffalo bullets and they come in a variety of Brunels and it allows us to, to tailor the projectile to the game. It seems like the, I'm learning, you know, fairly new to the, this world, and I'm excited about learning each of these micro elements inside the bullet. It's very, very unique, and, and I think that's where a lot of folks have the, the draw to make their air gunning um, that, that, that we're learning about. And it, 
seems like you, you do have to just be totally in tune. Everything is customized to the animal that you're going after. Um, that you just, you, sometimes you just, you end up taking it for granted when you're shooting, you know, your, your traditional center fire rifle. Uh, That's right. Is that part of the draw for you that you've come to appreciate and love over the years? A absolutely, because you know I love hunting, and I will do it with a, a center fire rifle. If I drew a sheep tag, <laughs> I'm doing it with a center fire rifle. Uh, but like you said, it, it almost becomes fait accompli. I mean, you get within range, and this isn't a, a, a a pot I want to open right now, but some people getting in range is 800, 1,000 yards. I, I, I don't consider that hunting. It's fine for some people if they can do it. I, I can make that kind of shot. I can make it on the second shot. The first shot, I can't read the wind, you know, a half mile away. So my second shot, I, I can do that, uh, but I can't do it on the first. But in answer to answer your question, I mean, I've, I've, I've run the gamut because I've hunted with handguns. I've hunted with, with a bow. I, I took a uh, Cape Buffalo with a 96 pound compound bow that was generating 115 uh, pounds of kinetic energy. You can get the same amount of kinetic energy out of a 78 pound bow now. Uh, but that was 2003, and you know there hadn't been too many people that had done it at that point in time. But a crossbow, a handgun, uh, I have not done black powder. But the thing about the air rifle is there's some things that could go wrong. I mean, you've got, it with the hammer, you've got 4,500 pounds of pressure inside of a tank. You are literally carrying an explosive device. And there's never been, and there won't be because of the safety checks that have gone into it. But you've got a, you're carrying a ball. And because of the pressure that's in there, you can do it, you do a full power shot with 3,000 pounds. But with 4,500 pounds, you can do two, sometimes three full power shots. And the hammer has a magazine that allows an immediate second shot because you work the bolt, it puts the second bullet in the chamber so to speak and you take your second shot and and you don't have to reload you don't have to air up again so that's a, a really great benefit but at the end of the day i don't know what's going to happen when i'm in the field with an air gun when i have a rifle i have a pretty good idea if i could see it it's going down that ain't the way it is with an air gun and it provides a level of challenge and you know, there are record books around, and some guys are, are blessed to be able to do whatever they want. And so I, I've seen people that they shoot every animal that is at a particular ranch in Texas. They might shoot 27 animals in, in Texas, and then they do it again with a handgun. And then they go and do it again with a bow. And this advent this is really an advancement because there were some people some big bore air gun shooters they're making their own guns i mean they're these guys are, are good this is a factory a factory product that has a retail of i think for 800 dollars. so this is something just about anybody can take up and it puts a level of difficulty on your hunt to a point where it ramps up the level of excitement because it is not a certainty that you see that animal that one, you're going to be able to get within effective range and two, everything's going to work right. Because sometimes with these, I don't want to say smaller weapons, but a handgun, you got to be very certain that your shot is clean because if there's anything that's going to deflect it at all, the shot's not going to work. You know, it, it, that's not as important with with this kind of air gun hunting because you're shooting a, a slug. I mean, you're, you're you're literally shooting a shotgun slug, and it can slowly. It's going to be able to plow through brush where something else might not. Right. 
So for, for Cape Buffalo, how, how heavy, you might have said that already, but how, how heavy of a slug are you using for that? 350 grain. 300 is the minimum legal, but uh, 350 grain is what I've used. And I, that's, that worked for me. The first uh, truly big animal that we harvested was a bison and we did it with the 350. It worked. I just haven't deviated from that. That seems to be the sweet spot between uh, kinetic energy and the decent trajectory. Right. So for the for the for the guys that are here in the states, um, I think as, and as of yesterday, um, Mississippi announced that they're going to allow they're they're formally announcing. Apparently, it was illegal last year that you can hunt deer. Uh, with your air rifle now. now. So I think there's 21 states that allow you to use big boy air rifles. So for a guy that wants to get into a venture into this, what, what do you tell people that how, and how to get ready um, to take up big boy air gun hunting? Well, let me, let me just make one statement because this is breaking news, even though this is going to be a delay. I'm testifying tomorrow in front of the Kansas Parks and Wildlife they're considering it and you know if they've got us testifying there's probably a decent chance that kansas is going to come on board so oh. but in answer to your question um like anything you've got to be able to practice so you need to have a range but most people have that what is kind of a limiting factor is getting air uh, being able to put 4500 pounds into a uh, a gun, it requires a compressor, and not everybody has a compressor of that size. Umarex now has a kind of a portable compressor you can do that with, but it's not even necessary to practice because as I, as I said before, 3,000 pounds, you can get a full power shot. And I bought a used scuba tank. I dive, but I you know rent gear, so I bought a used scuba tank. It's actually pink. Don't ask me why, but uh, I can take it to a scuba shop. They can fill it up. I can get untold numbers of, of full power shots out of that thing. Just put a different harness on it and just fill up the, take the tank to the range and fill it up and you can practice. And then to go into the field, the one kind of caveat with this to be really prepared is you should probably invest in a small portable, what we call buddy bottle of air that you put in your backpack. You take a shot, you take your second shot. Most of the time that's going to be plenty, but if it's not, you've got available to you the ability to put in three or four more shots worth of air out of that little carbon fiber bottle that weighs next to nothing. Right. It takes up a little space, but it doesn't weigh very much. So that's really all that needs to happen in order for somebody to get into big bore air hunting. It's, you know, go to a legal state and get a scuba tank. I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. Right. So have you, um, so how much hunting here uh, stateside have you done with, with the air rifles? Just the bison. That's, that's been, that's been it. Uh, you know, there's a limitation on, on the number of states. Uh, I anticipate I'll probably harvest an elk this year with uh, with the air gun. Um, was hoping to have done a bear. Uh, Umarex has done several bears. I was hoping to do it myself, but you know we can't get into Canada. Uh, but it just as states open up, Texas, for instance, instance, any big game species is legal. You could hunt a desert bighorn sheep in Texas with an air rifle if you wanted. Nice. I, I, I wouldn't probably put my tag on that, but, uh, but, someone, you, but you know it. someone might though. And that's, they the might. Part, that's the beautiful part about it. Uh, well, Maine, I just found out, I was talking to Chad from Leaf the Lair yesterday and he, he organizes a big Maine bear hunt. And apparently you can use air rifles up there. Okay, uh, good. good. He had some amazing things to say about how the, the air gun performed on a bear. Uh, there was last year and the year before, can't remember, but, um, so here's one question. You mentioned air, air being the problem. How do you, 
what's the setup like over in Africa? I'm sure everyone's going to wonder, like, what, how, how are you getting compressed air over there in the bush? Yeah, well, you, you can't. You, you can't take uh, a full bottle. I mean, it, it, they could cause problems on a plane. Sure. And, you know, I've had one of my buddy bottles taken away from me because I had it filled at a scuba shop in South Africa. Mm-hmm. Completely depleted. The, the gauge says zero but I couldn't take, because physically, I mean, they had cranked it on so hard, I couldn't get the, the valve off. And so they, wouldn't, they took it away from me. You, you take an empty bottle, a buddy bottle or two, you take the, the valves and you separate them, you know, so when you, you're gonna get inspected, TSA is gonna look at your bag because it's gonna x-ray funny. And they see you've got this empty bottle, so no problem with the, there's, there's two ways you could go about this. With the outfitter, you could arrange to have uh, air there, mm-hmm. um, or you could use a portable uh, compressor. And, um, y- you know, that that could get dicey sometimes. Umarex has come out with one that's much more reliable. I went with one that I got myself on this, this last trip, and uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually – kind of funny it wasn't at the time but things were going along great i'd taken like six or seven animals with with the hammer and i set the uh, compressor on in my chalet go to dinner come back the bottles usually filled by then and it was just clicking along but the sound wasn't right and it wasn't compressing anymore it wasn't putting any air in it was running but it wasn't putting air in right and i was about through with that particular hunt and we were in the part of South Africa that doesn't have a lot of scuba shops and they weren't, you know, they we're, we're kind of in the dry deserty area. Yeah. And I had a trip from South Africa, went to Zambia for a center fire, a, th- a 375 Buffalo. So I left the gun at the, the, the place that we leave luggage. And I had one shot left and I had this Cape Buffalo to do. So we, we went to the place, got the gun. It had lost a little bit of pressure, which, you know, now it's even worse. And what we did was I had a little bit of air, but not enough air because, you know, air pressure equalizes. And I had a couple thousand pounds of air in the buddy bottle, but like 2,900 pounds in the, in, in the hammer. Right. So... They had a large refrigerator that they put colas and beer in. So I put the hammer in the refrigerator, which cold air compresses, Mm. and so the pressure went down. I put the buddy bottle with a couple thousand pounds in, in the sun, and heated that up. And now the pressure goes up. So now my pressure in the bottle is greater than the pressure in the gun. And I was able to just coax about 300 pounds in. Now I've got 3,200 pounds. I've got enough for a full power shot. Thank the Lord I was able to take this buffalo with one shot. Because that's it. I had nothing left. Wow. That's not a story you can really show on television. (laughs) That's a, that is... MacGyver of the year story for hunting. Well, if I've heard of one, I, you know, I'm a lawyer by trade, so I don't know any engineering stuff, but I did get that from fifth grade science. So, you, you know, know, thank you, Mrs. Witt. Hey, you know, <laughs> we, 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 we appreciate public school here, right? That's um, right. <laughs> that's, that's an incredible story. Um, so, I mean, man, I have so many questions, so many more questions. Uh, I'm, I'm sure this is not the the, fir- the, the last time we'll we'll talk, but um, we've been on for uh, about an hour, and I don't want to keep you from the rest of your evening. But um, I talk a lot. No, I, I listen. I love. I'm trying to learn. Like I, that's the most unique thing about this whole project is that I'm not sit- I'm not trying to be on this platform and claim to be an expert. I'm very new to this. Like I've hunted my whole life you know, some of the animals that I've taken, um, big deer, elk, you know, turkeys, what have you, but this is a completely new world. So I love being able to just hear and soak up the knowledge 
and just and all I'm trying to do is just help navigate the conversation um, and and really get into this because I, I'm excited to see where the airgun community is going to see it becoming more mainstream and accepted um, and at home, that's what our goal is with with this platform with airgun hunting legions to be to really provide that home continue to provide a, a growing home uh, for people that want to get into it and celebrate the, the success of it. So, uh, so what are your thoughts overall on, on Aragon Hunting Legion as a platform? Well, I think what you're doing is fantastic because really the most important thing for this to take off is you've got to have opportunity and the states are coming around, not everybody, but there's enough where a lot of people can do this. So now you've got this air as a viable option. And I am of the opinion and have been for my entire career that we are in the minority and our numbers are getting smaller. And anyone that we can bring in to our tent is just one more voice that's going to support hunting. And there are people that are afraid of gunpowder rifles. There are people that are afraid of handguns. They think they're evil, but there's something about the, the Red Rider, Ralphie lineage that now it's really the same thing. It's air pressure pushing a projectile. And there are people that will be more comfortable with this. There will be opportunities for people to hunt with air where they won't be able to hunt with handguns or rifles because of the relative limited range that it has. There are places that are, there are a lot of places that are very liberal that don't appreciate hunting, approve of hunting at all, but they bring in sharpshooters at night to kill the white-tailed deer that have overpopulated their parks and their petunia gardens and places like that. What better weapon for an efficient harvest of surplus animals by hunters instead of paying somebody to come in and shoot these deer? Have hunters pay you to come in and harvest these deer and put the meat to good use. And you can do that with an air rifle. And the thing that I love about this hammer, and, and I'm not saying this because I'm a numerex guy, I'm just I'm saying this in general, but we now have an affordable weapon that can do anything from coyotes to elephants. Depends on what bullets you use, and it, de well, it doesn't depend on the pressure because you're going to get full pressure. You're going to take a full pressure shot, but that just changes the range and we have a gun that literally can do it all and you can get into this with the compressor of the tanks everything 1500 bucks and that's a lot of money but it's not for a hobby for life you know i mean i mean this is a whole new world and with a platform like yours that quantifies things that that is, is able to show people what is happening in the air world because this, you know, things change. I mean, departments of wildlife are adding this all the time, but I don't know. I live in Oklahoma. If I wasn't in this, I wouldn't have known that Kansas is, is about, or at least considering doing this. I wouldn't know that Arkansas, it's legal to do that unless I went out and checked the regulations. And why would I do that? Because I don't know anything about air, but something like this, you, you, you see what you can do. And if a guy can kill a K Buffalo with an air gun, I think I could probably kill a black bear. I, I mean, you just, you know that. And I have been accused on more than one occasion of doing things that are extreme. And I don't mean like extreme sports, but, you know, shooting, uh, 250 pound was the largest hog with a brake barrel air gun. A Cape Buffalo with an air gun, you know, those kind of things. But what I consider myself to be kind of like a test pilot, and I'm going to push the equipment 
to its absolute limit to know what it can do and do safely. Mm -hmm. So if you know that this gun can take three and 4,000 pound animals and dangerous game and break bones that are bigger than bones that we have, you know that you have something that's gonna be effective against black bears and white-tailed deer and mule deer and elk and moose. I mean, what a great moose gun this would be. Actually, I, the, Chad, I was talking to him yesterday, told me that one of his friends took the uh, first moose with an air rifle last year in Idaho. Um, oh, really? Try, I'm hope I'm going to try to connect with the guy because that would be an amazing story. Um, but you, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the technology's come a long way. And it really just comes down to, it doesn't matter if you're using even a centerfire rifle, a bow, or, or an air rifle. It's just, it's knowing your equipment, being comfortable with the equipment, and researching it too. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're shooting a slug out of an air rifle or you're trying to put together the best arrow. I mean, we, we, all, and we all intuitively understand that as hunters, that we research our equipment. We understand our, we had to understand the equipment. Um, as we go to, you know, we have to show our face into mainstream society and explain that away um maybe not explain it away but we have to be able to stand confidently right and but that's just a part of of who we are and what we do anyway it has to be ethical yeah no it has absolutely has to be ethical and, and it you're you're proving that um so i think the uh, the air gun community has a lot to thank you for <laughs> no i don't know about that thank but you, I'm yes, for taking fun. the risks of hunting major <laughs> game <laughs> Well, let's get back to that adrenaline thing we talked about. That's kind of you know full circle, but you yeah. know I'm that's I, I'm I'm just thrilled to be able to do it. Yeah, right. Well, I I, I can't thank you enough for, for coming on. I want to hear. Um, certainly, call me after the uh, after you testify for for Kansas, and if it, if it's if it warrants a another episode, it certainly would would do that. But I'm sure this won't be the last time we'll uh, have you on the on the video cast. I look forward to that, Jason. Thanks. Awesome. But don't jump off it. I am going to, we're going to say goodbye to the crowd now. Thanks guys. Oh, and tell everyone where they can follow you. Uh, and what you at Steve Scott TV, just the way it's, it sounds, it's spelled the way it sounds at Steve Scott TV. Perfect. Well, thanks everybody. Check us out at airgun legion dot airgun hunting legion dot com. Uh, check out our social pages, Instagram and Facebook, and we will see you on the next video cast. Bye, everybody. See ya.